Welcome to LED 3320. We're going to spend some time in the next, next couple of videos, or several videos actually, as well as in class, talking about matching schemes for matching children to just write books. Why, why should I match them with this book at this point in time? And the first scheme that we want to talk about is development. We want to think about where kids are developmentally in order to match them to books. So the first person we want to talk about is a theorist named Habighurst. He wrote a book in 1957 called Human Development in, and Education. And in this book, he talked about developmental tasks that children need to go through or achieve um, in elementary school in order for learning to occur. He said that they don't have to achieve these tasks in any particular order, so that means it's not what we would call a hierarchy. We'll talk about a hierarchy when we talk about our next theorist. So um, if we look at having her developmental tasks, there are seven of them, and I apologize, I'm going to keep moving the, um, the webcam, the video part, around a little bit so that you can see the whole slide. Um, what Habakkuk said, he said that um, elementary kids need to develop a satisfactory self-concept in order for learning to occur. That means they need to feel good about themselves. They need to have a positive self-concept. I'm important, I matter, I'm a good kid, that kind of stuff. Second, kids need to learn how to get along with their peers. Think about kids in elementary school, 22, 23 kids in a class, you know, they come to the carpet, they work together. If kids aren't able to get along with their peers, they're going to have a hard time being successful in that class and learning. They're going to be too busy fussing with the other kids. They need to learn their appropriate sex roles. Sounds a little bit stereotypical, um, and in some ways society has evolved somewhat, but if you think about young children, um, if they're not, uh, if they don't understand their appropriate sex role, they can be teased. Children sometimes are not nice. I think about um, a young neighbor I had years ago, a little boy named Travis. Um, he had a real manly dad, and Travis had some unique talents. One of them was that he could sing the entire Garth Brooks song, I've Got Friends in Low Places. Um, he was three, three or four. His dad loved it when he sang that song. It was manly. Another unique talent Travis had was impersonating Ariel from The Little Mermaid. That was Travis's most favorite movie. And when he would pretend to be Ariel, he would put a bath towel over his head so that it looked like hair, and he would pull it to the side, and he would say, Oh, Ewick. Scott hated it when Travis did that. And it was because he didn't want Travis to get teased at school. You know, so that was about Travis learning his appropriate sex role. Um, Havoc Hurst's fourth task is learning uh, development of skills in reading, communicating, and using numbers. Just basic literacy and uh, numeracy skills and the ability to communicate with each other. Uh, fifth is developing social and scientific concepts. So the scientific concepts are things like the idea of gravity, knowing that when you drop something, it's going to fall. Um, the social concepts are things like um, the routines that kids learn when they come to school. So where do you go in the morning um, when your parents drop you off or when you arrive on the bus? What happens when the teacher calls you to the carpet for calendar time? What happens when we go um, for reading time? What do we do when, we, when the teacher takes us to the bathroom? Okay, social concepts. The sixth one, development of values and attitudes. This is all about um, understanding that kids at this age are really um, internalizing the values and attitudes from home. Um, they are emulating the values and attitudes that they see at home. Um, and then the last one is development of self-direction. What we want to see in schools is that kids are responsible for their own learning. And this starts a little bit um, in the early grades when teachers create um, job charts and like in a guided reading group here are the things you're responsible for this week so we want kids to have some self-direction now when we think about having Hurst and these developmental tasks the idea is so what what do these developmental tasks make um, what, what do they matter 
the, what we know is that some kids sometimes are struggling to get through a developmental task. So when you're aware of that in your classroom, you want to match them to a book. Okay? It's not, uh, it's not that you want to just go put that book directly in the kid's hand. You're not trying to be a bibli bibliotherapist. What you're doing is making those books available, maybe sharing them through read-alouds, helping to move a child through one developmental task and onto another. It's not a matter right here in this scheme of whether or not the child likes the book. It's that you're trying to move them from point A to point B. So let's say you have um, uh, a child who's having a hard time getting along with their friends, getting along with their peers in class. There's a great picture storybook called Will You Be My Friend? You might choose to read that out loud. Let's say you have, um, or another one would be Wimberly Worried by Kevin Hinkus. You might choose to read that out loud. Um, so you want to you want to have a wide knowledge of children's literature and then watch your kids observe them to see how you can help them through books. Another theorist, and this is one you're probably familiar with, this is Maslow. So Maslow um, is the one who wrote uh, about the hierarchy of basic human needs. What Maslow said was that kids, these needs meet, need to be met in order for real learning to occur. Now Maslow's is in fact a hierarchy, so he said that we have to go through it in order. So when we look at his basic human needs, and I'm sure you guys have seen Maslow before, he talks about physiological needs, okay? This is the idea about um, whether they're hungry or thirsty or um, have, do they have enough rest, okay? Basic physiological needs. You guys know what it feels like to be in class and you really have to go to the bathroom. What are you thinking about? You're not at all thinking about what's happening in class. You're thinking about how badly you have to go to the bathroom. The same thing is true with children. When that need is not met, they can't focus on the learning. This physiological need and the research behind this and what Maslow did led to the government-funded hot breakfast in schools. So schools realized that some children were coming to school without a full stomach. And so the government funded hot breakfasts. Sadly, in some places, this funding is going away, but it's really important funding. It really helps support the learning in schools. Maslow's second need is what he called safety needs. This is, um, this is something that the teacher controls. Um, the student needs to feel safe in your classroom. If they are afraid, that fear is going to trump anything you do in your classroom. Okay, so it's about making sure that you're aware of what's happening in that classroom. Is there bullying going on or is there not? If there is bullying going on or there's picking or any kind of meanness, you need to address that because kids need to feel safe. If they don't, they can't focus on the learning. Belonging needs. This is about making sure um, that kids feel like they're an integral part of the class. They need to feel loved. Okay, so if a student's absent on the day they come back, instead of just saying your makeup works over there, tell them we missed you yesterday. So glad you're back. Make them feel like they belong to that community. The fourth one, esteem needs. This is all about um, uh, mutual respect. Optimum learning isn't going to occur unless the students feel like there is some mutual respect in that classroom. Again, teacher is um, a big part of this. Um, you need to respect kids and they need to respect you. And we show kids that we respect them by treating them like human beings. Speak to them in the hallways. Don't just ignore them when they walk by. Um, Self-actualization. This is the fifth need that, ha that um, Maslow talked about. And what Maslow said is that kids need to believe that if, in, if they are in your class, um, and they work hard, they can do well. If they feel like there's a wall and no matter what they do, they can't be successful in that classroom, they're going to live up to that. Okay, So you have to encourage them. Give them positive feedback. Give them constructive feedback. But if they feel like they can't be successful, they won't be successful and they won't be able to learn. Number six is what Maslow called the need to know and understand. This is just like having her number four, the need to be able to read, communicate, and do basic math. And seventh, 
This one is my favorite. This is what um, Maslow called aesthetic needs. It is the belief that because we are human, we all have a need to experience beautiful things. Children's literature can really fit right in right here. Um, children's literature uh, is not just about the stories, it's also about the art. And there's some beautiful art in children's literature. The stories are beautiful, the art is beautiful. It can help to fill that aesthetic need. So again, just like with having hers, you ask, so what? It's all about finding a child who's having trouble with one of these needs and matching them to a book. Doesn't matter if they like the book. The point is you're moving, you're using the book to move them from point A to point B. The last theorist that I want to talk about is a guy named Kohlberg. Kohlberg had a theory about moral development. What he did was he researched moral dilemmas and then looked at how we solved them. Um, and then based on the solution that we came up with or that the children came up with, he placed them on a continuum. You can do the same thing in your classroom. You can give students a Kohlberg type dilemma and ask them to write about how they would solve it or tell you about how they would solve it and then scale their responses on the continuum. So here are the stages that um, Kohlberg has on his continuum. Three levels, and within each level there are two stages. So level one he called pre-conventional morality. Stage one, obedience and punishment. The person solving the dilemma, their orientation is about what can they do to avoid getting in trouble. What's the best solution to avoid getting in trouble? Stage two is where they um, move away from worrying about getting in trouble and they start to think of rewards. What can I do so I get some kind of a reward, so I get something out of it? So they're becoming really self-centered. How could I solve this dilemma so that I get something positive? Um, level two is what Kohlberg called conventional morality. In stage three, um, this is where the kids are thinking about how can I solve this problem so people will say good boy or good job. Okay, They want praise. They're looking from, for praise. Stage two or um, stage four here under conventional morality is where the kids are solving the problems, seeking praise from a priest, a minister, a policeman. They're, they're seeking praise not just from the wider anybody but from an authority figure. Okay, that's the key difference between stage three and stage four. Um, you want people to say good boy in stage three. In stage four, you want praise from a priest, a minister, a policeman, some kind of authority figure. And then level three is what Kohlberg called post-conventional morality. In stage five, this is what he called the traditional liberal dilemma, and this is where um, the person solving the problem, and these are going to be older kids or adults, realizes that there are bad laws. I realize that this is a bad law um, or a bad rule, um, but here's how um, I think we can get around it. Stage six, this is the person who is solving the dilemma with the idea that there is no law above the sanctity of human life. Okay, so for example, they oppose war. Let's say they opposed the war during the Vietnam War, so they left the United States to avoid it. Um, this is somebody who's willing to put their life on the line for their belief systems. Again, not so concerned with the kid liking the book. You're about moving them from point A to point B. So this is, all of these are just about being aware of where kids are developmentally and making sure that there are books in your classroom and that you're sometimes sharing books as a read aloud or in small groups that can help move kids through these stages. One big caution about using development to match kids to books. As teachers, we are not trained to provide bibliotherapy, which is providing therapy using books. We're not trained to diagnose problems and we need to not do that in the classroom. We do need to understand where our kids are and have knowledge of a wide range of books so we can make sure they have books available to them that will help move them from point A to point B with development. In the next video, we'll talk about some other ways to match kids with books, but in this video, the focus is solely on matching kids to books based on development.